and everyone will hear this me saying this <laughs> so we'll just give it a minute i'm just so anyone that's joined i'm just giving it a minute to catch up because youtube does that um but welcome so just bear with for the first awkward minute of filling space before i um before before we actually start talking about what we're here to talk about um okay great we've got 44 viewers so it seems to be working i'm just going to double check from my colleagues that they can see it streaming how are you both nick and john i've just been hiking across the mountains for six days so um i'm quite tired but raring to go okay I've got, oh, a thumbs up. Awesome. I've got a thumbs up from Dan, which means that it's working. So I'm going to cut you off. No one wants to hear unless we could. I don't really if, care about Nick or his feelings. So. If people want to put in the chat if they prefer um, to hear about John's holiday, let me know. Um, OK, great. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming along. Um, I can see you all streaming in now, joining. Um, so thank you for being here for our first uh, Wild Service Book Club. This is one of 13 book clubs that we're going to do um, to take, hopefully, you, the reader of Wild Service, um, through through reading the book and understanding it and having the great opportunity, I think, to meet some of the authors, all of the authors of the book, um, to find out a little bit more about why they wrote what they wrote and to dig a little bit deeper into Wild Service. Um, I'm happily joined by John Moses and Nick Hayes, um, editors of Wild Service, so are probably best place to talk about it to start us off on the book club. Um, and do we do we introduce you both? You have to introduce yourself first. You are oh okay. Sorry. Is right to write Hello everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Nadia Sheikh, um, and I am happily campaign on the Right to Rome campaign, and I'm also an author of Wild Service. I'm here to chair this evening's conversation so that it doesn't get out of hand, has been known to get out of hand, but also to um, bring in your questions. So I've got a team, um, Jess and Dan are somewhere in the background sending me your questions because I can't keep an eye on it all at the same time. And um, so we will be spending a good chunk of our time answering your questions. But before that, um, hello, Nick. Hello, John. Thank you for being here. Hello. Um, I think I want to ask the first question to both of you, because whenever I ask this question to anybody, any uninvolved in the book, um, everyone gives a different answer. So I think it's useful to have both of your answers. What the hell is Wild Service? Nick Hayes. Oh, <laughs> Wild Service. Hello, everyone. Thanks, everyone, uh, for joining as well. It's really good to have you all here um we're excited about this one i think this is uh this is basically the us laying the foundations for the kind of countryside that we'd like to go forward into uh we've kind of you know with guy shrubsoles who owns england uh with the book of trespass we've kind of done all the moaning this is how it got taken away uh this is the amount of rivers that we're not allowed to swim in you know duh, blah, 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 blah um now it's time for us to kind of push open the overton window and actually show uh what the future might look like with public access but also crucially uh with that kind of other missing element of the commons uh which was what was taken away from us which is to remember the responsibility and the care and the kind of active sense of belonging that we can bring to the countryside, which was all of our responsibilities before people decided they'd fence it off and call themselves owners of it. Um, and that kind of service, as we're calling it, uh, is a completely necessary now because no one else is doing it. Uh, but also it's really liberating, uh, it's really empowering, and it gives people uh, the energy, we hope, and the kind of uh, the moral backbone um, to go out into their land and uh, to actively protect it. That's my answer. What's what's Wild Service, John? <laughs> or have I got the wrong book? <laughs> it's the right one. Yeah, yeah I think... Um... I, I like this idea that we've done the moaning. Um, there is some moaning in Wild Service. Uh, <laughs> but I'd say you're right that in a sense, this is moving on from the moaning and towards the dreaming. Um, I, I guess like for me, you know, 
any time we do a, a media appearance uh, and talk about the Right to Roam campaign, we always get in that slightly snide, paternalistic voice. Oh, yes, but we've heard about your rights, but uh, what about responsibility? Um, and it's always this kind of like put down gesture. It's this kind of like perlocutionary act where you basically um, imply that you are one of the responsible, of course. Uh, so we need to talk about like the little people and the damage they do now. Um, and to me, World Service is the kind of 300 page answer to that. And it says, well, what does it mean to take responsibility like really seriously? Because actually uh, the right to be responsible is a more radical concept than the right to roam is actually um, because it sort of removes the whole edifice of ownership uh, and exclusion um, from both like, accessing land, but more importantly for its, for its kind of for its care, for its protection. Um, so for me, this is a kind of like an attempt to vision out the kind of grassroots vision of ecology that we've started to see, I think really like reflower in this country in the last decade or so. Um, you know, I live just up from the River Wye, which has become this kind of emblematic case for the damage that can be done to our river systems in the UK. And the reason that the River Wye is on the map is because it's had one of the most powerful kind of local guardianship groups rising to its protection. Uh, and that was in the face of the Environment Agency who said, you know, nothing to see here uh, as soon as a few years ago. Uh, it was in the face of the kind of the poultry farmers uh, and the poultry producers um, who were effectively responsible for the, the eutrophication of the river uh, and in the face of the water companies as well, who are doing all the, the damage that we, we've we heard about so much in the last few years. Um, and where did that come from on the why? Well, it came from it being one of the 3% of rivers that has a statutory right of navigation, uh, which means that you could actually paddle on it and swim in it without being shouted at. And also that had really long standing bankside access as well. So the whole kind of community along that river knew the river, they knew something was wrong with it. Uh, and when it came to it, they rose to its defense uh, and they've kind of just been on the offensive ever since really kind of holding the government to account, the polluters to account. Um, you know, the polluters are really on the back foot now. They've had to acknowledge um, what's gone wrong with the river uh, and are rapidly sort of scrambling to take steps to mitigate the impacts. Um, you know, I was at a meeting a month ago, uh, which, you know, in a little kind of sort of town hall theatre type thing, you know, and this is in this kind of small conservative market town, and like 500 people turned up to that meeting <laughs> about the river and its condition to hear from the people that were, were doing damage to it, what they were going to do to fix it. Um, so for me, that's in, in microcosm. I think it's a one very powerful example of something that's been happening all over the country, actually, in the last 10 years, but in this kind of quite individual and maybe like quite fragmented way. And it hasn't yet kind of cohered as a as a sort of as a story or as a kind of like a collective movement, I suppose. And I think for me, World Service is an attempt to give a name to that and to try and kind of stitch those um, different kind of parts of the constellation into something that's more whole. Thank you. That was a nice full answer. Um, I did. Um, that's that's really useful outline both of you about what Wild Service is. I guess I want to leave what questions I had down and respond to what you're saying. So sorry, because you had these in advance, but I guess um, you made the point there that we, there's these things happening, but there's, it feels like this, I feel like you're saying there's a missing piece um, because there are these things happening that you've explained. Why is there a missing piece? Um, and how is Wild Service filling that? I want to kind of understand, I want to get like a little bit more into the feeling of, what someone might feel as they're reading it and why has that been missing yeah I mean, do you want to respond to that and then i mean in, in, instinctively i kind of reach and think about um you know the kind of trade union movement um and this kind of tradition of like working class collective consciousness where like the little strike that you're doing uh, in your mind in the valley over there actually is part of this kind of like national story, this national struggle where you can really like see and recognize each other across like quite wide, even very, very wide geographical spans. Um, and I think we need something kind of like similar for nature, you know, the, the, the sort of trade union movement's been on the back foot for the last kind of 30, 40 years. We never really had a trade union for nature. We never had that equivalent thing where actually me acting to protect my local river and just intervene in something here is, is sort of woven into this bigger story where I can see and identify all these other protectors and defenders for the natural world um, kind of around the country or across the globe. Um, and I think that's what's kind of exciting about this book for me because it's, A, it's trying to sort of do that piecing together um but it's also kind of drawing in the kind of international story so it's you know it's looking at like taking inspiration from uh kind of forest defenders in ecuador for instance uh or in new zealand uh, and the maori culture and trying to say like what these guys are doing 
that's like the cutting edge really of like the defense of the natural world and what does it mean to kind of translate that back into our own culture and, and into our own context um so i think that's that's where we're sort of like pushing towards i think we we haven't we've never had a kind of story or a kind of like collective consciousness around the defense of the natural world really or we have it's been kind of mediated through activist organizations and big ngos and that sort of stuff um and i think now's the time to kind of take it down a notch basically and sort of like look at each other and find each other uh, and create that kind of tapestry for ourselves and it's That's um iconic. it's the commons as well isn't it it's like uh you know we've um there is a whole land justice movement rising at the moment uh in england uh talking about the growers or uh anything from land in our names to the organic growers uh network to uh land workers alliance there are people that are forging a connection with land that is about belonging uh far more than it is about ownership and this is the crucial kind of dichotomy that we've uh forgotten the whole of england is organized around ownership at the moment and your rights and responsibilities of ownership but what does it mean to have those rights and responsibilities of belonging and the commons has always been so much more than just a scrap of land uh, that you can walk your dog on. Uh, it's been where community plays out. The problem is that we have forgotten that community means a lot more than just our next door neighbors and our humans, uh, but it also uh, uh, includes the flora, the fauna, your kith and your kin. Um, and for that, unfortunately, it's it, in a way, it's England's tragedy. We don't have a link uh, to that past uh, space where we were reverential of nature. So to turn to learn from that, we have to we have to turn uh, to indigenous cultures. And like John said, we've uh, there's uh, Aboriginal Australian, there's Maori, uh, there's uh, Indonesian, there's Papua New Guinean, there's we have drawn from the cultures that still have this living sense uh some might say animist sense of the value and the worth of nature uh that is something that we've been uh insulated against those those fences do a lot more than stop us walking on the land they uh they restrict our engagement and they the chapter i wrote they they reduce our culture uh with the land um and so I, I think the commons is something that we're trying to recreate through acts of wild service and through acts connection. of wild service yeah let everyone be a commoner again yeah beautiful um and so i guess that's probably a good point to actually just um link just to kind of re-establish and make really clear the link between the right to roam campaign which you know you've both touched on in terms of this is where we start that this is where it's become but i think just to i think it's useful to reiterate that point and maybe embellish it a little bit more that um what is the right to roam about and and why does wild service make sense now beyond i think just we can say well we're being responsible as well what are the other links there so i think you know the, the, the tendency in the access discussion really or the kind of discourse around access has been dominated i think by physical and mental health basically uh in the last like 100 years um so you know the kind of kinder trespassers and the language that they would use it's about like working class people needing like access to the air access to the countryside for like you know for, to fill their lungs basically uh, which is completely understandable when you're working in the factory all week and you you know this sort of the physical environment you're trapped in in the city is like polluted uh, and all the rest of it so and I, I don't want to like diminish the kind of physical and mental health side of the conversation um but i think now in the 21st century it needs to go beyond that question of just like the physical and mental health of us and it needs to go towards that question of actually we need this for ecology we need this for like to fix the kind of mounting crises that we see in our ecosystems at the moment because the government is not doing it the regulators are not doing it and you know the kind of the, all the incentives in the kind of market driven system that we have are to externalize uh basically all the kind of negatives of your your businesses and your operations and just dump them onto nature and kind of leave that off the accounting book like it's invisible um so you need people back in the land who have a kind of meaningful powerful 
even spiritual relationship to those places to say actually this isn't invisible this is like you're basically like dumping a kind of like sewage system into my church um <laughs> and you know and that it would be so like deeply offensive in our culture to do if you put it in those terms and yet that's what's happening every day and of course people have steadily i think begun responding to that and i think that's why rivers have become such a kind of dominant um, political narrative in the last kind of like few years really but it's taken us a while to get there i mean the, you know the pollution crisis and the biodiversity crisis has been going on for decades now um and so i think for me that it's about kind of moving the kind of access discussion on to its kind of natural next step really which is about yes ski poles recreation physical and mental health but more than that this kind of like deeper more numinous connected relationship with the natural world in order that we can kind of claim back our agency basically uh you know and i think there's there's a kind of although this has kind of been born out of tragedy in a sense that the state's basically given up and the regulators are basically given up protecting the natural world that has opened up a space for us i think to start like claiming the sort of moral authority to be like back in the land again um and I think, yeah, and that, to me, that's 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 really kind of exciting. Um, yeah. Thanks, John. And you mentioned church there, and I think uh, it will be that all of the other book clubs we get to dive deep into the chapters, but we don't into the prologue because we haven't got the opportunity to do that. And that the idea of the church is very much in the prologue. And Nick, I wonder if you can speak to to what it is that you say about the church and how you kind of what when did that idea come to you? Because I remember we spoke about that way back in january last year we were walking along a field somewhere in wales was it wales or england john at this point because we were in and out like the hokey cokey you were uh, in the west borders you mean in the woods that, that would have been england <laughs> yeah and you were talking about it then nick when did that idea come to you well i don't necessarily mean it in a uh, religious or a uh, kind of um uh, I'm not religious myself. Uh, I can walk into a church uh, or when I've been inside a mosque, uh, you are aware uh, that there is a reverential quality uh, to it. You are aware that there are kind of unwritten social codes. There are beliefs that are uh, uh, that extend beyond your lifetime. You're kind of communicating uh with creeds and morals and ethics and histories of those ethics uh that are that go back uh long before your lifespan and there's also the sense that it, it they will continue as well um and of course churches were modeled on trees uh trees were the first churches uh you know they've always been uh, it, in England as well, there's still records of uh, the worship of trees. But really, it's about congregation. I think John was right. There, there, there's something about wild service. We're not reinventing the wheel here. We're not introducing this idea. There's litter picking groups over there. There's water sampling groups over there. There's people that do amazing stuff in their local community. But what happens when you bring it all together and you bring a congregation of people together and you start um together on a kind of horizontal plane developing your code of ethics that's exactly what a commons was no one no one wrote down the laws of the common they were peculiar and particular uh to that specific locality and it was the community uh that did it and because they weren't uh written down they weren't set in stone uh they were plastic they were uh, pliable they they changed with the seasons um, and then you guys were all there when we went for our trespass uh, to um, Richard Benyon's uh, estate, formerly the guy uh, who uh, was in charge of telling us how much access uh, we should be allowed, uh, and currently the owner of at least 20,000 acres. Um, and some of them are just down the road uh, from where I am. And it just struck me as a bit bonkers uh, that his 12,000 acres of uh, Hampshire and West Berkshire, uh, but for a couple of meager and quite miserable rights of way, uh, were just completely shut uh, to the public. Yet St. Mark's Church, uh, just next door to this enormous mansion that he lives in, uh, opens its doors to the public um, uh, like, most days of most weeks uh you know uh barring sort of specifics 
uh and so i looked into it i was like well don't people rob the slate from churches roofs and don't they you know don't they go and sort of thieve the you're nodding nadia like yeah oh, of shit. <laughs> i'll take yeah. that lead thank you very much no more leaky roofs um and then it turned out that there's this whole body of literature on like the church of england and, and the catholic church they've all looked into this like what is the answer uh like we believe like first of all i was interested why do they want their doors open what is it about that you go to church on sunday or uh sometimes in the evenings but no they want spaces of contemplation for people to come and connect with that kind of higher other um but what are the problems and all of the literature basically said that uh they've tried many things but they found that uh, the more eyes and ears you have in the church, that sense that there's other people around, that sense uh, that anyone could walk in at any time, actually increases the security of the church. So I just thought these two, these two buildings, uh, you know, the Lord of the Manor's uh, mansion, it basically looks like a castle, Richard Bennion's home, mm. um, next to the church, and yet these two completely different ideologies um and saint mark's anglefield the vicar is a wonderful woman uh it's it's just a really truly beautiful place to be and we've been in there and you know that secret thing where you open a church and it's all all yours basically and you can sing a song you can have a think why the hell aren't we doing that in our woods and our rivers there's plenty more of them because we can't oh yeah <laughs> Just a reminder. Thank you, Nick. That that, that details it beautifully. Um, I think that's given us a really nice introduction as to why the Right to Wrong campaign has moved to telling this story of wild service and what it is. Um, but just to for those listening, or people who are going to listen after this has gone out into the world, um, they're going to pick up this book. Um, and what are they? This one there. There you go. Um, what? Tell us about a little bit about um how this was stitched together because it it is a book with different authors and it's not all written by the same author um and so you're going to go on this journey reading through this book um what will they expect physically with i guess the different chapters and i guess hopefully emotionally what is that journey um john do you want to talk a little bit about the book itself yeah sure i think in a way it makes sense to me that this is a kind of multi-author book with like lots of different perspectives because i think the whole kind of thrust of what we're talking about and the kind of theme that really cuts through the entire book is that you you can't restore nature in a monoculture you know <laughs> you have to create like the diversity of culture the diversity of perspectives the diversity of people is part and parcel of creating like a diverse kind of biologically intact ecosystem as well um and so i think we're, we're always interested in this entanglement of kind of like multiple voices multiple perspectives multiple beings uh, all kind of like entangled in this like beautiful kind of smush together um and i think that's the kind of like objective that we're aiming for um so the kind of the structure of the book really is that you're you're taken through these like keywords um that form the kind of like what i would say is the kind of like mosaic i suppose of this kind of philosophy that we're trying to to sort of spill out on a page so that's stuff like you know reconnection it's stuff like recommoning it's stuff like culture it's guardianship it's stewardship it's kind of reciprocity um it's all these kind of like key words that i think give us a sense of yeah these kind of like different nodes in a constellation um that we're trying to like pull together to call wild service um and then interspersed between those chapters are accounts of what we call wild service and action so these are kind of like a thousand words um basically kind of profiles of people that are just fucking doing it basically um so people that are just like through an act of kind of mad inspiration or through an act of kind of care or love uh, or habit or whatever have just begun kind of arbitrarily effectively restoring uh and kind of like re-energizing uh their kind of local environment just because they they just because they care and just because they love it without ownership and without permission um so there's these kind of like i think profiles of yeah the sort of i guess like the vigilantes of, of wild service effectively the, the kind of like the front runners and the pioneers of it as a project who are just kind of doing it in their own um yeah of their own volition so um you know nick wrote a great piece about it, this guy called adrian who basically like 
makes these kind of elaborate seed bombs that he fires from a catapult while he's like wandering along this path every day <laughs> and he's basically kind of magicked up an orchard um over the last like 20 years of doing that um so, so people like that who I think give us this kind of inspiration, I think, for for the project that we're we're sort of pushing forward. Uh, and then finally, we've got these kind of architectures of belonging as well. So these kind of little essays about the kind of features of our landscape that that speak to the sort of the culture that still exists. I mean, again, like Nick said, it's not like we're we're inventing something that like isn't there already. It's like actually we're just trying to give a name to it. So you know, when you see a rope swing, when you see a clouty tree. Um, you know, when you see these kind of like objects in the landscape or like the Bothies in Scotland, what you're seeing basically are a kind of architecture of the commons that's there and latent in the landscape. You know, kids, when they put up a rope swing, they're not like thinking, oh, did I, who did I have to write a letter to get permission to do this? You know, I have to work out who the landowner is. I have to go to the land registry and, you know, pay my kind of 10 quid fee or whatever it is uh, to find out the kind of like parcel of land and realise actually it's all registered in the Virgin Islands to some, you know, like kind of basically kind of babushka company that's you know stuck inside a series of dolls or whatever um you know kids aren't doing that they just fucking do it right they just they they, they make the swing they, they find the natural spot uh, and it, and the swing itself uh, like creates this kind of like natural commons around it um so i think we're kind of wanting to draw attention to these kind of like beautiful enchanted things that are like right there in our site if we just look at them in a different way and they, they speak to this kind of like rich tradition of englishness um that isn't really about kind of like national uh national tropes or like kind of like national identity it's like it's quite quintessential to who we see with ourselves as a nation and yet it's like flies utterly in the face of the kind of like the dominant orthodoxy of how land should be used and accessed and connected with yeah. i love that nick did you want to say anything else on that oh just rope swings is everything for me <laughs> i i can tell i mean when i read the book i actually think my favorite bits are those bits that bring it to life like it's like oh it's happening it's real we've all got it in us i don't know you know <sighs> just loved it but it, it it takes you from like a rope swing which is just uh kids or their parents and a stick and a bit of rope uh through den uh through can uh through clouty tree and, and and sort of ends at bothy and Bothy is a sort of architecture of belonging. That's that's something that exists and crucially is maintained by a group of volunteers that care enough about the outside and getting people out there that they'll go on weekends and fix the plumbing and uh, redo the roof with some of your lead, Nadia. And, and like we recognise that. That's part of the Scottish right to roam, but it existed long before the Scottish right to roam and essentially those bothies they didn't necessarily bring in the Scottish Land Reform Act but they certainly uh, were kind of uh, emblems of that spirit that existed there a long time before and yet with all these other things like den we don't see a den uh, for what it really is we see it as kids messing around but that is kids messing around they're playing they're feeling at home they're turning up when Amy wrote that, you know, they're pulling uh, pulling up old bits of stick and they're seeing uh, the millipedes or the stag beetles there. That's learning. Mm. Um, and I, yeah, I felt very strongly uh, right from the off that uh, we ought to pay those elements of our landscape the respect they deserve because they're happening in spite of 600 years of enclosure. Uh, the spirit is still there. Kids don't get born uh, with the concept of the William Blackstone's treaties on <laughs> personal property. Uh, they have to get drummed in that it's wrong to swim in that river. And unfortunately, in, in many cases, that does work. But the spirit of the human uh, is found uh, within nature, basically. You know, we're, we are naturally drawn to it. Yeah, that's really beautiful. That image of lifting up the stick and seeing the millipede, but also just, you know, that ever enduring smell of Scott soil that's just on your skin when you're a kid. Like I, as an adult now, me as well, but just as a kid, you just like, your hands would just stink of earth just, and it would become the backdrop of like playing out. And um, if you were lucky enough to be a kid that was allowed to be let out, um, which of course is a whole, different topic same topic but different conversation just quickly nick from me were there any um uh 
things on the cutting room floor like uh, what other examples of humans in the landscape <laughs> exist <laughs> maybe there aren't any and i shouldn't have asked you yeah wicker man was the one just at the end of uh <laughs> what to do with all these landowners now they've <laughs> all these big empty mansions <laughs> hmm. hey nicholas <laughs> don't don't burn the landowners um but yeah uh get out on a rope swing near you if not build one you don't build the ropes with you you just tie it um okay cool um so why now why now for wild service um what change what real change can it bring about who wants that I go on john um i mean i think for one it's it's in the ether right i mean these issues and the, the kind of like the the numinosity and the kind of like the animism of the natural world i think is is having a moment again uh and i think you know that's that's not just us i mean you know Rob, Rob mcfarlane has got his book coming out is it next year i think it's getting released is a river alive um you know the rights of nature is is kind of back on the agenda in a big way and it's kind of percolated into uh kind of western legal thought now um you know this this feels like a moment and a pivot point i think um in our understanding what our relationship to the natural world should be um so i think this is our kind of contribution to that um i think secondly it's we've had 14 years of austerity the environment agency has been gutted you know the the kind of the effective like state-led regulation of the natural world um has just been shown completely wanting um and so you know people and that you know that's been a real catalyst for people basically diying the job pretty much um so i think that's given it a sense of urgency as well um and i think the, the final thing i guess for us and for the campaign is that you know we're you know we're, we're pushing for the right to roam all day and for access reform and that kind of stuff and i think that we we don't want to lose sight of what the kind of the, the deeper meaning the deeper purpose of that kind of political campaign is um you know we don't want it to just be a kind of like administrative transformation of like where people can walk their dog you know if that if that's the end result of this and that would be a failure i think for us it's you know the right to roam is just the precondition it's just the beginning point that allows us and gives us the kind of means to create this like wider and deeper culture so i think if we didn't like name that now and didn't, didn't give a voice and a direction to what access reform should be aiming to then there's, there's a danger that we might get what we want but it will just become a bit a bit aimless and a bit and a bit pointless um, and maybe you know have some some kind of general benefits for recreation, physical, mental health, and that kind of stuff. That it, it loses the kind of transformative power that I think um, it can potentially achieve as an agenda. So um, yeah, that's that's my why now. I think. Nick, why now? Well, I'm not saying I'm sick of talking to people about dog shit and litter, and uh, the basic assumption uh, that right to roam means trampling. I'm not saying I'm sick of hearing the word trampling from every single interview that I've done on the BBC to Channel 4 to whatever kind of thing. But it is time to open up the conversation uh, to what all of the members of right to roam really give a shit about, which is, ah, there's no, it's time to stop being scared of the hippie, basically. Like we, I, I love rivers. I'm on one at the moment. I, I swim in it every day. I love rivers. I love their flora. I love their fauna. I love their atmosphere. I love the way they make me feel. I like the way people interact around them as well. People are conversational. People, this River Thames is a commons. There's rich people in rich boats. There's poor people in poor boats. There's dog walkers, fishermen, swimmers. People have to figure it out. There's that thing about the commons that it's way more than just a patch of land. It is uh, horizontal power sharing. It is mutual aid. Um, I'm not going to go that far and call it anarchism. It's not. It's not time to. <laughs> that that would be for the next book. But it's five past seven, Nick. But, yeah, five past seven. <laughs> but my point is that there is a paternalism. Uh, all of us know this tone uh, that have been doing interviews uh, non-fucking-stop for the right to roam. Uh, the, the paternalism that they open with, that sense that uh, we don't know anything, uh, we don't know what we're talking about. To really know what you're talking about, you've got to own land. How many entomologists own land? <laughs> like these, There are 
experts in England that are completely discredited by this uh, obtuse Georgian system uh, of ownership. Um, and I don't think any of us are really contesting uh, like necessarily ownership. We're not talking about like uh, bringing the state down. We're talking about the extremity of dominion and the repercussions that that dominion has had on nature. And to try and explain to people that we are nature, there's no way an irate lawyer on the Vanessa Felt show, early morning BBC, is going to take that kind of shit from me. So you've got to take 300 pages. You've got to present this block, this kind of, this collaboration of different perspectives that actually gives you something to work from. It's like this solid sort of base that we can then start walking from. And that's what the book is. We're, we're hoping that it's actually going to be a lot more of a book. It's going to be a touchstone for people to point to and say, well, that's what I'm doing. That's what I believe in. Mm. And that's why wild service. Yeah, that's beautiful. I also think when you say that's saying that's what I'm doing, that's what I believe in. I think there's an element I think that people will find going, that's put words to the thing I was thinking because it doesn't yet exist. Mm. And I think that's something that... Um, throughout my career and my life I've been really frustrated that nobody else seemingly around me I come from a conservation background it was like no one's saying the thing that I'm feeling and I hope that maybe some people will pick it up and find a paragraph and be like that's the nugget and um, thank you I'm gonna run into some questions now from people um and I have a few more closing questions from me at the end of that hopefully unless this leads us <laughs> down a path uh, over a fence, over some barbed wire. Um, okay, if you could arrange for wild service to to mysteriously materialise on the bedside table of one or two people, who would it be? And I'm going to add, and why? <laughs> oh, I don't know who to go to first. I don't know who's got one ready by your face. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Sorry. I was reading another question while you were asking. Oh, so. were you? Okay. So, uh, John, you have magic powers all of a sudden, and you can arrange for the book Wild Service to mysteriously materialise on the bedside table of one or two people. Who Ooh. would that be and why? <laughs> <laughs> you can have a real version and then a funny yeah, version. Yeah, I'm thinking there's the, 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 the PC answers. And, um, I mean, the, the, the kind of boring immediate answer is, uh, and you know, hopefully will be on his bedside table, is uh, the, the Shadow Environment Secretary, Steve Reed, who's likely to be the uh, future Environment Secretary uh, in about a year's time, because um, I think this is the kind of injection of thought that Labour Party and the powers that be need to be understanding at the moment. Um, yeah, and I think they, they need to understand that the kind of the dynamics on the ground have changed, that nature's in a crisis that's not going to be resolved by, you know, just refunding the Environment Agency, um, if that's even part of their kind of agenda. Um, so that would be my kind of initial um, boring answer. My, my sort of more interesting answer, and this was probably poaching one of Nick's, is um, I'd like on the, the sort of, he doesn't really have a bedside table, where's all damage. Um, maybe he sort of like stuff it down his, uh, his little kind of... Um, um, store or a pal or something um but i i would like to sort of present it to a, a kind of an, an animist kin of the landscape um so that they feel a bit more seen <laughs> oh i love that <laughs> <laughs> nick they just shit on it <laughs> i love the book out <laughs> they just ceremonious shit um like we've got a. Uh play the fucking Westminster game and John's absolutely right the the way the system is set up that uh yeah Steve Reed's our only hope but Christ when you see the people that are making decisions about our nature uh when you see a photo of them in the room and I'm talking ramblers CPRE the whole the whole lot it's just white guys in lanyards and that's it uh, and I, I do not, I do not think that this shift uh, comes from politics. Uh, I, I don't. I, I think every bit of effort that we're doing, uh, absolutely right. But this is a cultural shift that happen, has to happen within people's hearts, minds, and souls. Uh, and that's not wishy-washy hippie shit. 
that is a complete penny drop that I, I know all three of us uh, from Right to Rome on this call, every single person that we work with every day on Right to Rome has had a series of these kind of epiphanies that it's like, oh, I, like my belonging here is not in question. Uh, the law uh, that refuses my belonging here is in question. And actually it needs to defend itself from me. <laughs> like, they th th there's there's no moral there's no moral reason for me to not be here uh and the the immediate thing that they say is like well you can't you know something to the lines of you can't be trusted but who said you can be trusted so for me uh yeah john's i, I wrote my whole uh chapter on uh mackenzie crooks wurzel gummidge because i do just think it's the greatest thing since the sistine chapel He's a kind of um, magical scarecrow, by the way, for confused listeners. <laughs> everyone knows who Wurzel Gummidge is, John. Let's not have that argument again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, nice. But for me, yeah, it's um, it'll be Mark Rylance, I think. I feel like he is... Uh, I feel like we need to start looking at our musicians and our actors and our clowns and our mm. circus groups and our storytellers uh, uh, we need to, this is not just entertainment, like, and, and our access to nature is not just recreation. Uh, these people, the only moral sort of creed that I've got from my life has been from uh, the plays that I've seen, uh, the books that I've read, um, the songs that I've heard and sung. Uh, I, I think it comes from culture, and I do obviously think that Mark Rylance uh, in Jerusalem when he played uh, Johnny Rooster Byron, that was a... Uh, I never stopped going on about it. That was that's something literally magic uh, mm. happened there, and um, uh, to a great extent spawned the Right to Rome campaign, and, and further to that, the Wild Service. So... When we do eventually get a right to Rome, it will be Mark Rylance's fault. <laughs> I'd like to see uh, the Mark Rylance Cromwell as a uh, <laughs> brought into the mix for nature as well. I think that's uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you do Jerusalem, Nick. I'll I'll, I'll take the Cromwell. <laughs> yeah, lush, good combo. <laughs> Sometimes you don't guys just say things and then I'm sat here going, the fuck do I go with this next? Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And that leads us nicely into a question that we've got Anna from Anna, who's asking us, okay, so Nick, you're saying that it's not going to come from Westminster. It kind of is, but it also isn't. It's going to be this mass cultural kind of like, oh shit, all of the pennies dropping. We can hear them. Like, it's like when you go take your coins to the Asda money drop. Um, <laughs> And then it comes out like three quid and you're like, how? Um, <laughs> so uh, we mentioned that it's time for us to look amongst us for this change. But how how do you move a society into caring and acting? And this is something that um, we get in the right to run quite a lot. And I have throughout my career in working in like change. The question that we get all the time is, what can I do? It's an interesting question anyway, um, as to why do we all feel helpless? Of like why isn't it immediate obviously what what you can do but also um uh which i just think is is general because there's always a question around like how do we move people and um, but how do we move people into this um beyond wild service or is it wild service is everyone going to read it <laughs> how are we going to move people into caring and acting i think it's not that I want to like kind of duck the question or like reject the, the premise, but I guess um sorry, Anna, for your question. For me, it's kind of like pe people are already well, there's a question how you scale it, right? But people are already doing it. And I think that's the crucial thing for me. It's like the the you know, I, I I've got a kind of academic background and I remember reading all these kind of like earnest, you know, sort of like Marxist anarchist texts for that sort of like theorizing the new conditions of like proto social movements and how it all might play out and this kind of stuff. And just kind of pouring this stuff into basically like an empty void. And you just thought, well, what's the point? Who's this even speaking to? And I think the, the kind of key with this book really is it's like, it's already like the you know the horse is already like galloping ahead and we're like <laughs> we're kind of running after it being like ah like maybe we can like make this horse meet this horse and like mother people you know we're sort of trying to like stitch to it together in hindsight and so i think that that changed the the dynamic a little bit because i don't want and i don't think this book is uh an attempt to kind of like 
preach down to people or to like tell them like you know that oh you know we 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 the willing and we the people that care like we need you to like step up and care more or something like that like i don't think that's the kind of dynamic on the ground yet i think there is a legitimate question which is probably to be much more fair to 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 Anna, the questioner um is about how you scale that actually and how it how it kind of reaches out of kind of like particular demographic bubbles perhaps um as well and i think that's that's a more complicated question but i think probably actually you know, it's it's a long term process. It's a twenty year process at minimum, uh, and it requires people to go through all the different phases that you go through as you start to kind of develop and build your own relationship to the natural world, which includes fucking it up a lot of the time. If I'm honest, so you know, if I think even of my own kind of like trajectory or whatever, it's like yeah, you start as the kid, maybe you've got access enough to the green spaces to go and seek out the dam, dam or whatever. I mean, I think kids are amazing at finding these kind of like interstitial sort of odd like spots in the landscape like what which maybe calls like the unofficial countryside it's always like you know the kind of like weird little spot between things that is not really regulated but is often quite wild um and that's often where people start and maybe you kind of like have a fire that you shouldn't do or something like that maybe even leave some litter and that kind of thing you know sometimes i come across these like proto camps from kids and i like see it as my contract to them really to kind of clean up after them because that's given them the chance to like have that relationship that connection then maybe you can take it further and you get into your mountaineering and you take try and get all the gear and you do all that sort of side of stuff um and then maybe kind of hit the limits of that and realize that there's something missing from it too and then you and then i think for me it's like then you move into that more more spiritual sense of a land where your eyes are actually drawn to the kind of like the little invertebrates um on the little bit of water that's actually just outside your door rather than driving four hours to a national park that's miles away so i think it's given society that that space um to kind of go through that process so like leave space for people to cock it up and not just like scream in the face and use it as an excuse to exclude people further which is basically how the whole dominant conversation around access works at the moment um and then i think we need to like quite seriously take the issue of massifying nature connection um we need to take that seriously and at the moment uh, i feel like a lot of these kind of like large NGOs or whatever, like their model is based around like, you know, kind of buying bits of land and and kind of like producing kind of glossy brochures and that sort of stuff. I'm being a bit flippant, obviously. So apologies to many environmental workers who do amazing things. But, you know, really, actually, there's there's no one like, why is the RSPB not just like thinking, actually, how do we like bus in like people <laughs> every weekend, basically, to give them like amazing, enriching, enhancing experiences in the natural world that aren't kind of like kind of stuck in a little straight jacket um or aren't just doing what the schools do which is you know you get your like your one adventure weekend where you will wear like hard hats or whatever and you kind of basically do a bit of like cheap version of go ape or something like that rather than actually learning how to like be in the land and live in the land um you know there's this amazing um sort of a school, sort of forest school that i talk about at the end of the chapter but i'll speak about this in a couple of weeks but a little little snippet but you know basically uh it's called the stone age school and it's a kind of like primitive skills um school for like kind of home educated kids basically uh and like you know within a few months really those kids who are like you know 9 10 11 can tell you like 12 different types of mushrooms and kind of what their medicinal uses are and they can like you know build a build a bow out of like you know the kind of natural materials that are around them in the wood and um you know they can tell you all kind of things about how you like track a badger or something like that you know i mean it, do, it doesn't actually take that long to get people to that quite intense and quite powerful space of connection and relationship we just literally haven't tried um and so i think i would like to see almost a kind of like war footing for nature connection effectively um uh, for society and all the ngos and all the conservation sector that have the money and resources to do that to like really reorientate their interests around that so it was a long answer but, yeah. but it was a goodie though it was, all <laughs> it, was a, it was a good answer thank you john um i think we all got an insight into john's journey into connecting to nature there uh Nick, did you have anything you wanted to add around how do you get a whole society to care and connect? No, John said it uh, really. Like, <laughs> not, to, but I, I want to get through as many questions as we can, and I could, um, you know, embellish it with like there, there, there's plenty of story. I, I, I think when John was speaking, I was thinking of an experience I had with some kids uh working class kids from a forest school that was actually a charity that the teachers spent most of the time fundraising so that these kids could get their free education not from the state but from the hard work of these sort of like six teachers and i met them because they 
Uh, they nicked a biscuit tin of poetry and harmonicas and uh, shit that me and a mate had kept under the roots in the woods where we had our fires when I was in my 20s, how the Book of Trespass opens. Uh, and But they left in its place a little um, leaflet uh, was saying their name and I got in touch and we met up in the same spot in the woods and these teachers are fighting an uphill struggle because they're just trying to give their kid they just ran around in those little rubber onesies that kids wear when it's muddy kind of thing but they were they were used to it so they'd come back with stuff that they'd found and they'd be like what is this what is this and then the learning begins um so it's not hopeless for us adults either. There's loads of community-based ways that we can enter uh, nature with or without the landowner's permission uh, and and learn about it primarily, because only then can you see not just what the problem is, but really specific to that location, what it needs to fix it. Just going around planting trees, as Brewdog have discovered, um, ain't gonna cut it. Um, I've paid for yeah, at least 10% of them trees. <laughs> Apparently, all charity for they me. mark that on the map. <laughs> That's <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. Um, I have so much hope. Do you know what? I know it's all it's so cheesy, isn't it? I have so much hope in children. Um, when you go out with kids in nature, they find the best fucking stuff, and it is treasure, and it's just the most like amazing feeling. Um a uh, question about the book and the authors here from Tyler. Um, how did you choose the authors to be part of the book and were they already part of the campaign? Who are they? Who is this rabble of human beings that have come together? Um, Ryan e. Ella wrote uh, Belonging. Uh, I think you knew of uh, her work, didn't you, Nadia? Like, yeah, uh, Brian e asked me to be part of a film that she was making and she's an artist and um and i was like well i'll be part of your film you be part of this book <laughs> but yeah that i died yeah that's how i knew brian he is an incredible artist but yeah it's seriously incredible like the real the real arts like uh, getting the community involved like chalking up uh loads of tarmac uh that people go to work every day she's just this uh incredible talent um and so what, what we really did was divide, um, you know, initially it was 12, then uh, it had to be 13 because, you know, there was just so much uh, stuff. But we divided what is this topic of wild service? How can we divide it up into these chapters? Inheritance. Uh, my mate uh, Romilly uh, is a shepherdess up on the uh, hill. She's just come down now because all her lambs are done. Um but just through years of conversation with her, uh, she wanted to write something um, about like inheritance. What does that mean? That just means property, doesn't it? Like uh, that's the first thing that we think of. But what, she's a mother of uh, three brilliant uh, young women now. Like what does, what does it mean? Like what's, what's her responsibility? What's our responsibility to pass on to our children? And certainly I haven't got, uh you know land to pass on so what's what can you pass on so knowledge uh uh experience all of these kind of things which are crucial to the experience of belonging um so i won't we got nicola chester to write about community because i'd read on gallows down and i thought if there's anyone that can write about community not just the human community but how uh rural communities uh interplay with their kind of uh rural uh ecology that's got to be nicola chester eh? you don't normally get a voice on the countryside to to speak <laughs> because at the moment the kind of like the countryside conversation is basically dominated by landowners and the kind of 
the farming unions pretty much like those are the people who get uh, like uh, who are understood as like the authentic voices of the countryside and obviously they are a part of the countryside and I, I think they should have a voice um but we don't really get to hear from like actually every time you do a kind of poll on kind of very all kinds of countryside issues inclu including the right to roam what you realize is that there's about 70 percent of people who live in rural areas whose uh, issues are never addressed and whose opinions are never addressed and actually they're they're treated like urban uh, like urban opinions essentially so you know we, we did this polling on kind of the urban rural split on opinions around um on a, on a right to roam and you know lo and behold there was no difference between urban and rural opinion on it about 70 percent of people supported extending uh the right to roam in the countryside um and yet if you asked anyone in the media or in politics or in journalism for the last 10 years you know what what right to roam is they'd be like oh well that's like you know that's what the urban people want to impose on the on the countryside and you know that's how the kind of the cla and the countryside alliance and all these kind of official organs uh, that in theory represent the countryside but of course don't they just represent a very patrician narrow sect of it um would uh, that's how they would understand those issues so i think what i was kind of interested in what happens actually when you give a kind of totally different sort of person a voice uh, and that includes people like romilly who are like farmers but they're also so much more than than farmers as many farmers are themselves you know like you know it's kind of she, you know she's a, she's a dyer and a, and a and a witch and a you know kind of like <laughs> in, in a botanist and a, and a musician and like yeah and I, I think kind of the people that embodied like i said earlier that kind of like actually the sort of the diversity of the culture that used to be our rural culture uh and that that's been kind of collapsed into this sort of like downton abbey fantasy that we now have about the countryside and that, that that's what rural culture is it's you know it's tweeds and it's kind of blasting pheasants with shotguns uh and it's these sort of like made up traditions basically that are like carried out by the lord of the manor um and to me that's just a great shame that we've kind of like swept away this kind of like weird strange and like hyper diverse culture that we had for you know generations and generations and generations um and yeah, really, this this book and this campaign is is yeah, kind of a tool to start bringing that culture back. And it still lives; it's still there in the countryside. Um, you know, like the like the Cleachy Tree and like the Den and like the Rape Swing. Um, it just needs something to kind of like resurrect it, nurture it, and um, yeah, kind of like point the light back towards it. That's beautiful. Thank you, John. Bear with me a second while I grab the book. So, on the front cover is this very lovely shiny. Do you remember Pokemon cards? This is like the best Pokemon <laughs> card ever. <laughs> you can't judge a book by its cover, but let me tell you, everybody, judge this one by its cover. Um, why? What is this face? Who is this person? Why is this the cover of Wild Service? That's that's the Green Man, uh, and I wonder if I mean. It would be great to get into this discussion, but um, the green man, I mean, the green man means a million things to a million people, basically. Uh, it's this old English uh, folk trope uh, that some say was kind of invented or kind of amalgamated into what we know of it now by the Victorians. Others claim it goes way back into prehistory. Um, what I like about the green man is is kind of precisely that. He's green for starters, uh, so he's not white or black. He's not. Uh, he's kind of gender specific, but the green person uh, just didn't. Well, maybe he can be the green person because there's no there's no template of what the green man looks like. There's no definition of him. Essentially, he is a person that is nature. Um, I read a a, a brilliant book by Sophie Strand, uh, who's a poet from America, and, and she was talking about Tom Bombadil, uh, the the least, uh, or the, well, the sort of least recommended, he's, he's not even in the films, Peter Jackson films of the, uh, of the Lord of the Rings. Um, but I loved it, because I'm here uh, literally on the border between uh, Berkshire and Oxfordshire on the river, uh, and Tolkien apparently, who, who wrote much of his work around these kind of valleys uh described tom bombadil as the uh, the spirit of the or the vanishing spirit of berkshire and oxfordshire um and i tingled when i felt that because like tom bombadil does not look like anyone uh he's he's a cultural uh creative uh really uh reciprocal response uh to the valleys of oxfordshire and there's something about the green man um, 
that has that he's constantly flourishing he's growing uh what are here world service and oak leaves out of his face uh he's sticking his tongue out at you which i love i've made the tongue look like a heart but that's basically he's kind of going like that he's doing his ozzy osbourne uh he does not give one fuck the green man he does he exists before on the land before nation uh before race before uh any of the certainly before barbed wire fences um and for me uh i'm very passionate about the green man um but we did have conversations about it that uh, are, are we channeling this down uh too much of an english folkloric uh route um is that exclusive exclusive but also exclusionary um is is it touching close to that kind of nationalistic fervor, that kind of, uh, you know, that right wing uh, kind of blood and earth, that kind of English uh, um, ugly side of England? Um, uh, but those are all conversations, to be honest, that we want to have. I think we can jump into it a little bit because we've got time to do that. And I think I think I guess the question that certainly that we do have this conversation within the right to wrong team quite a lot is about our relationship with folklore and exactly what you're saying i'm personally somebody who never really grew up around that i was aware of folklore i i maybe i need to do some deep dives into my brain um because i'm sure it would have seeped in but like the green man very much for me felt like this weird other thing that i saw crop up every now and then in quite kind of spaces where I do not belong um and slowly it's taken me you know we were talking before about the penny drop processes it's taken me quite a while to be comfortable with that so I think it's worth just I know it's a huge subject but can we can you touch onto that Nick that um that kind of dangerous space that you mentioned where it's like oh is it not a little bit close to um well this this is kind of uh the next book that i'm writing which okay. is about uh oxfordshire and berkshire uh the colonial uh heritage the wealth origins of a specific estate that romilly the shepherdess uh lives on uh um you uh, and and what's worth saying here i think is that there is the massive elephant in the room that what we've done for each and every one of these chapters like romilly's leans on a hero of both hers and mine, which is uh, a man called Tyson Young Porter, who's uh, the founder of the Indigenous uh, Knowledge Systems Lab in uh, Melbourne, I think it is in Australia. Um, and she's talking about yarning and dream time and uh, really specific uh, Indigenous uh, kind of uh, thoughts from Australia. I've been deep in uh, Lakota and Blackfeet uh kind of spirituality and animism for the book uh that i'm writing and also trying to see how because the wealth origin of that estate was building railways all across canada and uh north america and one of the saddest things about this refusal that england has uh to not just apologize but but to begin the process of reparation uh for all the crimes against humanity uh that were that were that we affected um one of the saddest things is that we can't look uh indigenous elders in the eyes and ask them for their help uh without that kind of nationwide uh acknowledgement of uh the crimes and the extraction of wealth uh that has made england flourish um so i think that's all written into uh what i'm looking at in this next book as well is the kind of shame uh that uh english and british people feel about their kind of ancient culture not only the shame but the kind of complete lack of knowledge that we have like the dream time in australia is like forty thousand years old uh as i go into in the book like all of our literature uh, that connected us to pre-anglo-saxon times even anglo-saxon times was burnt by rich men that bought uh all the uh libraries and the monasteries of henry the eighth in the dissolution of the Mo like our culture was burnt by landowners 
Um, and that's not just a slant on it. It all went up in smoke because they didn't care. They were they, they were buying, you know, yard sale property, like bargain bucket basement prices uh, for all of our libraries uh, that would, you know. So there is this crucial, crucial cognitive dissonance between us being able to have a spiritual relationship uh, with the land uh which has been so severed uh from our um from the experience of this uh country that we're in at the moment whilst the government and the crown and all of the people that claim to represent us as the heads of state repeatedly against every surge every tsunami of urging and politeness and uh and anger uh from all of the Commonwealth nations uh, offer only this kind of weak, cold tea cup of regret, and they will never apologize. Um, and so that's the work of the next book that I'm doing, because before they do that, then our relationship with the culture of our land uh, will be forever tainted uh, by the people that basically divorced, the very same people that divorced us from uh our experience with the land as well it's hard I, I haven't yet i mean i haven't yet finished writing the book so i haven't got my little pithy <laughs> paragraph on, on on that kind of thing but it's a massive story uh that england needs to start speaking about and there are many uh indigenous uh knowledge holders that are yelling for english people to get back in touch with that kind of um i wouldn't call it i wouldn't call it indigenous it would be wrong to uh because that side of england uh just because where we are our geography you know the, the we're an island we were always um sort of with uh all sorts of other people that migrated and came to stay but there is what sophie strang calls a chthonic like a a a, a soil based relationship with the spe specificity of this area here uh which we call england for want of a better word actually there is a better word it used to be called merlin's precinct which was uh, uh quite yeah pretty cool <laughs> but um but th these these indigenous knowledge holders are basically calling out for us to reclaim that relationship with the land to reclaim a kind of spiritual knowledge-based story-based culture uh with the land or as tyson Junker porter puts it like we're all fucked um so we need to get over that hurdle yeah. of awkwardness but we can't do that unless we have a blunt conversation about reparation and repair yeah yeah thank you so much nick couldn't agree with you more on that um so um sometimes in my head i just think for me it's so you know sometimes when you laugh because something's so not because it's funny but because it's like this is insane and it was that like oh i've got a relationship with nature i belong and it's weird and i can do weird stuff with it now and i can make up my own traditions and i can make up my own like I've got my own little things that I do when I go down the beach. Like I've started to create this whole world of like belonging based purely on me going, no one can ever tell me that I don't belong. And I've got mm. all of these little rituals and I've got all this little stuff. And it's like, like rejecting the awkwardness of being a hippie and rejecting the awkwardness of that. Um, I guess that whole weight for all different cultural and complex reasons is just hanging off the back of it all of the time. And obviously, at the core of that is reparations and um okay john i don't know if you want to add anything to that i mean i suppose just on like the appropriateness of the the green man i mean what i like about the green man is you know there isn't a doctrine there there's no ideology there's no kind of leaders there's no policy proposal like it, it's history is one of like you know the green man kind of arises in a culture it's like the beautiful weed that's kind of growing through the sort of concrete cracks of the dominant culture you know that that to me is what the green man represents and it's sort of like sort of 
attaches itself to in these kind of un unorthodox and unofficial ways to the kind of official culture at various moments so it's like you'll see like the green man kind of carved in by the stonemasons on certain churches and stuff like that as this kind of like pagan maybe symbol that's kind of just come out of nowhere and then has been sort of just like planted itself next to the kind of official spiritual bastion of the time it, it, to me it's this thing that we like reach back for it's the kind of like the substratum that's like the kind of the, the the sacred like below the kind of like do doctrinal ideas of what kind of religion or kind of official spiritual practice should be so in that sense i see it as like a powerfully non-exclusive like avatar um that can kind of like bind uh, a kind of a collective desire or a collective will but not in any kind of particular like doctrinal direction and i think that's what i like about world service as a kind of potential project in this moment in britain at this time that you know we have uh, a country at the moment where if you poll on pretty much any issue you know the, the kind of division is like this uh normally kind of fragmented by by age and political perspective and whether you voted brexit or not and that kind of stuff and the only exceptions to that generally are things like actually uh, nature, the countryside, access policy, that's when suddenly all those kind of divisions that you'll see on pretty much every other polling question in this country start to collapse and get a little bit muddied. Uh, and so you kind of, to, you need a sort of avatar that kind of holds that like almost collective contract to just like be together and like focus on this like thing of like shared and collective love that's not exclusive. Um, and I think like a, a kind of just a nice story I think for this. Um, so like down down the hill from me is this this weir that i've been swimming in since i was a kid basically and it's where all the kids go to you know talk about inheritance it's where all the kids go like generation to generation get taught about the swim spot and then they come out there in the summer and then they build their rope swings and all this kind of stuff you know it's where i had my my first kiss and you know smoke my first split and all that kind of stuff. um you know it, it's it's exactly one of those kind of illicit places of the like unofficial countryside that i was speaking about earlier um and then kind of 10 years ago uh Cut a long story short but it, you know all the access to it to this kind of unofficial spot got removed uh, and loads of gates got put up security cameras went up you know loads of angry signs went up um and basically the the access got kind of rerouted through this kind of absentee landowners place um and i kept trespassing anyway um because it's my local swim spot you know i've got a <laughs> much deeper relationship to that that place than, than the landowner does um and I kept having this argument with the the gardener who'd come and like help out at the sort of absentee landowner's spot and he'd like row with me about trespassing and we'd sort of back and forth it and that kind of stuff and this happened kind of three or four times um and then a few months ago i went to uh, a, a, a gathering really for citizen scientists on the river mono so all the stuff i spoke about earlier that's been happening on the y they were trying to promote it happening on the tributaries of the Y and the Mono is one of the tributaries where this weir is. Um, and I walk into the room and I meet the the kind of lead citizen scientist for the River Mono. And it's this guy that I've been arguing with you know, for like the last six months, having this row about my like rights to be on this place that to me represents my absolute connection to that river. And suddenly it was like, the very thing that had like just been dividing us and that was the only thing that like, like we the only relationship that we had with each other was now all of a sudden the very thing that was uniting us like the the, the love and connection to that river and suddenly we sort of like saw each other it's like ah like you weren't just trespassing to be like a hoodlum or you know something like that you, you were trespassing because you care and because this river means something to you and i saw ah you weren't just the guy trying to like kick me off uh, and you know scream down the kind of exclusivist rights or whatever you also love this river so from this place of opposition suddenly we had this kind of shared story uh, and the shared kind of project and that made me into relation with people that i would never have met otherwise uh, who may or may not have been on different parts of the the polling dial uh, on all kinds of other issues um so and to kind of loop that back round, i think you you do need avatars you do need emblems you do need kind of stories that hold that kind of thing together because it's not politics it's not like political outlook that's going to hold that together um and maybe it's these kind of like amorphous like oddball kind of like yeah sort of um figures like the green man that can sort of stand in to represent the sort of ephemeral connections that we have the kind of like the the deeper sort of connections that, that form us that aren't kind of yeah political or doctrinal or about kind of your opinion on this or the other or how old you are or you know whether you voted brexit or not um so yeah sorry a long-winded answer again but it's a long-winded one but a goodie you nearly lost me i had my first kiss and then i was like <laughs> for about <laughs> for about 90 seconds and then had to come back in um such so as the childishness um uh lovely we're coming near to the end i would like to ask one of you to read the last paragraph of the prologue um so give each other eyes to decide who whilst i ask the last whilst i ask the last question from the audience and um and then maybe just i'll i'll ask 
I'll ask John or Nick to read the last paragraph um, and then just a few closing remarks before ending this first book club. Um, so, yeah, quick question then. Uh, this is from Louise. What role do you see for imagination activism in your work and the wider movement, as in imagining a different future where the right to roam exists and where we practice kinship with nature? Ooh, I mean, go on, John. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I think kind of quite early on in the in the campaign when me and Nick first met each other and started chatting, I think that so i think connected like where we'd gone politically or what we kind of saw the potential for a new campaign to be about um was kind of taking magic more seriously uh, and i don't mean that in a kind of like sort of like idle hippie kind of way um i mean it in just literally the sense that like you need campaigns that kind of reconfigure what people imagine is possible that reconfigure the sense of what reality is um and that you can so much of like what kind of excludes us from the natural world is fundamentally psychological it's something that's happening in our head it's not really the law because the law is actually quite weak on trespass you know it's only a civil offense and all the rest of it um it's it's the psychological effect of what that kind of like that wall or that fence or that kind of like anticipation of confrontation is going to do um to you and so there's a kind of like a dispelling that needs to go on in the body and inside the mind um and i think that's what Kind of to me the role of like art uh, and a kind of imaginative thinking and utopian thinking i suppose does um in activism because it, it sort of literally reconfigures the reality in which you are operating such that suddenly like the wall doesn't really exist exist anymore it doesn't like exist in the, it doesn't represent what it used to represent to you and the barbed wire fence doesn't represent what it used to represent to you and as a result of that you just start acting in ways that are kind of completely different um so i think you know kind of art and the imagination it's sort of like reconfigures what is possible in the in the landscape in your day-to-day -day life in your day-to-day -day reality um you know and my, my own relationship with my own local environment which i've known for you know pretty much all of my life has completely changed as a result of this campaign because suddenly um i've just been like oh yeah what if i did just walk along the river that i've never been able to walk along one day and then all of a sudden forming all these connections and relationships to these places um that i never knew even existed uh, and kind of rethinking and reimagining actually what the river means to me and making it part of my story um and all of that has really come through you know basically reading nick's book you know a, a bit of art and imagination and, and through those kind of like beautiful images and, and just through the kind of like the ideas that percolate in your brain and sort of reconfigure the conditions of your reality until you start just acting in a way that's completely different um and yeah that's that's how activism and magic and imagination i think all kind of meld into each other um, nice that's beautiful nick yeah like magic's magic is real for sure uh you can pull a rabbit out of a hat but that's that's conjuring uh or deception but magic is um uh potent communication that changes the reality of the world you know this is what uh john was talking about perlocution or like what linguists call speech acts you can make comments or i saw laura marlin uh come into the victorian albert hall or was it anyway south bank center and just silence a fucking crowd of however many uh, thousands of people uh, unplugged, uh, just um, just started playing and everyone shut up and the feeling in our blood changed. Uh, that's quite powerful. That's music and charisma and uh, talent that has done that. Um, I saw the Sheffield tree campaign, Rob McFarlane, uh, uh, wrote a poem about it. Uh, Jackie Morris illustrated it. I did like a sort of um, a poster for it. Not only did that change the way people thought or coalesce or, or sort of gather together uh, the way they thought, uh, it raised enough money that it kept people out of prison uh, paying their bails. Like that's that's like solid evidence uh, that magic exists. Rob McFarlane came up with something in his head that stop people going to prison that's communication that's powerful uh communication and so i it's no good to just do the magic though like the culture uh comes 
with the protection of nature like uh you know uh you 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 go and mulch uh the trees uh you go and like uh uh clear the hedges and you know do what you need to do and then you sing the wassail uh you, you you've got to you've got to put it in because the, the the real danger is that otherwise it becomes this kind of faux indigeneity where all the top knot gang go and gong bath uh and 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 think that they've changed the world by doing so but it's it's not that it first come comes the lived experience and then comes the culture and then comes the lived experience through the culture you know these things are reciprocal but we're working we're trying to get rolling from a standing start here we've got to have something uh that kind of gets us going um so 100 percent, it is about uh the artists of this land and that is everybody because that's another whole zoom meeting about how art has been commodified by capitalism and therefore makes people think that they're shit forgetting that it's the process of doing art singing songs who gives a fuck whether you're flat or sharp the process of breathing in air and then pushing it out again uh with noise <laughs> is is what animals do uh and it's fun and it's collective and it's beautiful and there's nothing i like more than doing it outside like give me a fire and a banjo you can sod the right to roam <laughs> see you next week <laughs> yeah exactly I mean, I think it's it's so latent, isn't it, in our culture at the moment that, like, you know, I see it in the kind of the recreation industry, which is our sort of like officially approved way to be in nature. And, and you can see it in the festival culture as well, to some extent, that we've kind of excluded people or taken people out of the means by which to create actual like organic culture collectively together in their lives. And then we've kind of given them this like sort of shortcut ticket back in for a kind of like sort of segmented period of time to pay you know 200 300 quid or whatever for your festival ticket um or for you know go, go on your walking trail or something like that um and we, we're trying to like shortcut culture all the time and as you say nick it's kind of like we're trying to jump to the to the end result and actually it was it was always the process it was always the coming together it was always the kind of like um the actual like tangible doing of an, an acts of care that that were the thing that was that gave it all meaning in the first place and instead yeah we sort of we buy our way back in and then we kind of transpose various like ceremonies and rituals from abroad and rather than thinking about okay how do we translate that into something that's a kind of practice for us that feels like meaningful uh, and connects with our own cultural traditions and heritages whatever they are um and instead we're just going to sort of like grab them wholesale and you know do do the sort of like amazonian ayahuasca ceremony and like you know a field outside luton or something um and then be like okay job done um and, and of course it isn't that i mean you know w one of the most kind of i suppose like profound nature connection experiences that i've had was um the, just the act of kind of like processing a, a deer carcass with a small community of people over the course of you know five six days or something and basically becoming a kind of accidental mesolithic you know hunter gatherer kind of crew again uh, and when i went into doing that i was just kind of interested in the sort of like practical skills of it and, and that sort of stuff you know we're culling deer all the time at the moment for ecological reasons and this was a way to like really think through what that meant and maybe have a more kind of like uh, held and thoughtful um relationship to, to to death and the death of animals um but actually what i realized in the process of that is like by day three like my dreams were kind of inflected by the deer and it's like you'd sit around the fire with these like random people that you didn't know from you know from adam three days ago uh, and just be like randomly coming up with like songs and poems that were about the kind of about the deer and about the kind of the stuff that you were just doing in the day and it just happened very like naturally and organically um that you were basically created culture through the practice and through the kind of like the collective endeavor and you're like oh yeah shit this is this i totally understood why you would kind of do cave paintings <laughs> basically by the end of, of six days it just it just became so intuitive um that the kind of yeah this this sort of constant like looping effect of how your whole life and your brain your sense of self is being mediated through the through this creature that you're engaging with in this quite complicated way uh, and then learning to track it and you know getting inside its brain kind of almost quite literally uh, and then yeah kind of the painting of the avatar on it you know <laughs> almost on, on the cave wall um almost as a way to kind of like sort of take that that kind of um mind mapping forward i suppose um yeah so that that's 
I've kind of lost my, my thread of where I'm going there really <laughs> got, got lost down the lost down the deer path um but yeah I suppose it's yeah as, as you say it's about kind of moving on from this idea that culture can just be something transposed or like bought and that it doesn't have to start with the work um, and I think that's you, you know we can't just have a wild service festival or whatever uh, where we all have a like nice time and talk about nature you know we have to like get some jobs done you know if we were we were down the river roading the other week pulling loads of trash out of the river planting willow trees you know like helping like nurture a sort of like proto swamp into being um you know that's that's the grim work and it's the hard work but it's the fun work it's the meaningful work and it's the kind of like the work through which culture will actually grow in a meaningful rooted way i think um yeah thank you thank you john and i think yeah there was a question around that uh in the chat which i didn't really ask which is like how are we going to do this what are we going to do next and there will not be a wild service festival um i think and i think that's a really lovely message oh, to end on. Work, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um uh there might be some kind of squat festival at some point but not 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 what you expect um uh i think that's a really lovely note to end on it was never in the end product. It was always in the doing and it was always in the process. Um, and I feel like the final message maybe I perhaps would like to give people, although for the chair and the interviewer, it's probably not my job, but fuck it, um, is that uh, uh, don't expect necessarily to read the book and think that maybe the work will be done and you'll get it. And maybe it's just, it's in the process of asking those questions of yourself. Um, and enjoying it and seeing where that takes you. Um, the next book club will be John Moses um, with guest. Jay Griffiths. Jay Griffiths, wonderful Morris. author, Jay Griffiths, um, national treasure. Um, on the third has been called <laughs> she will, she'll make that. On the 30th, um. on the 30th of April. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, so if you haven't already ordered the book, um, do and it will arrive before then so you can read the prologue and then you can read john's chapter and then get into the dirt around and ask john questions about it and also um i think you'll enjoy hearing jay um ask john questions about it from her point of view as well i'm sure that will give a completely different perspective um she's an incredible woman i'd like to leave like, on a little bit about what it's about sorry just as a brief uh, you can do. We've got two minutes left, and I was going to suggest we leave on reading the last paragraph. But um, but we uh, <laughs> but we are going to send out on our socials and maybe perhaps in our newsletter what each next one's about. But um, John, would you like to use the last two minutes to talk about that instead? No, no. Ed, <laughs> <laughs> no. He's sulking. He is. He's sulking. John, do you want to sulkingly read the the last? Oh, I, I think like it's so beautiful. I feel Thank like it's you. Nick. Nick boy, have you got the book near you? Have you got the book near you? You read it. Read it in your Mr. Badger voice, John. <laughs> we can do what we like. We're generating culture here. Tradition. Ahem. <laughs> <laughs> we borrow the name of this concept oh. from the Wild Service Tree, <laughs> a rare and overlooked member of the Rose family, because it is a, it is a fitting emblem of this culture that needs to be receded in our, in our soil. Once common in our hedgerows and forests, it is now either unseen, unrecognised, or just plain absent from most of England. The tree was once integral to our society, its berries being used for centuries in the production of beer, a relic of which is still seen in the pubs and that bear its colloquial name, the Checker Tree, and even the Prime Minister's country retreat, Checkers. But there is something more to the tree. The shape of the leaves is unmistakably reminiscent of the human hand. By the end of this book, we hope you will join us in seeing this leaf as an evocation of the open palm of belonging, the extended handshake of community, the opposite of the gripping fist of ownership. In this physical echo of our own bodies, the leaves of the wild service tree remind us that in spite of the fences, the laws and the arguments, the divide between us and nature has been contrived. Wild service reminds us that with each other and with nature, we are and always have been one nice thank you everybody enjoy the rest of your evening it was a joy to have you here and we'll see you back on the 30th of march with your book and your pencil and your questions at the ready thanks for coming thanks everyone end live stream end live stream is live stream over